Can you like in there? Is it? It's you. You're good. You're so good. You're good. I know you're really good. I thought, oh no, I might miss you. But when I saw your name, I was like, oh. Good morning. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Today is Palm Sunday, and I hope you all got your palm as you came in today. It's a day of joy and worship. The one day on earth that Jesus was praised and celebrated, and so we honor him today. We honor him this morning. If you'll look at the back of your bulletin, we do have a few announcements on there. We have our last um, in-person Bible study on the Lectio Divina series on Wednesday, so please let us know if you're going to be here for that. And we will not be meeting online anymore. Instead, we will be having a Monday, Thursday service at 7 p.m., so I hope that you can all come. We're going to have it in the fellowship hall downstairs, and we'll be having a service of communion and um, remembrance and hand washing, and so I hope it'll be a powerful service at 7 o'clock on Thursday. How about other announcements? Yes. Yes, keep donations of food, items, um, some hygiene items coming because the pantry is being used and we can use more donations. How about other announcements? Any others? Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. So definitely come here with great joy and celebration. We'll be here for a big Easter worship, so um, it's such an exciting time in the life of the church to kind of enter into this holy, holiest of weeks um, as we step in from Palm Sunday to Easter. How about prayer concerns? Do we have any prayer concerns, updates, celebrations? Yes. You want us to have our name? Laurel? Okay. Lori's asking for prayers for her mother this morning. Her mother has some dementia, and so we want to lift up Laurel in our prayers this morning. Yes. How about other prayer concerns, updates? Um, and Jeanette's asking prayers for her, Casey, um, who we've prayed for before, um, has had some long-term effects from the COVID shot. Well, now they've found something in her brain, so we definitely want prayers for her. How about any others? Yes. I, not yet, unless you have something you want to announce. I'm not sure what to say on that, so um, anyways, uh, Marge has gotten moved, so we um, are happy for that and hope that it turns out well. So we'll keep Marge in our prayers. Um, so we'll keep her. Any others? All right. Well, let us tune our hearts to worship.
please rise and join our voices together for the call to worship from Chalice Worship. Cry out, people of faith, rejoice and praise God. Cry out, people of faith, for your Savior draws near to Jerusalem. God saves. Blessed is the one who comes in God's name. Blessed is Jesus Christ, who did not turn back for fear of the cross. God saves. Blessed is the one who comes in God's name. Now, please join me in our song of praise on page 192, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And as we sing this morning, let's wave our palm branches in the air and honor our King. And we'll, see, uh, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3, all three verses. Now, I know I don't see any young people here officially this morning, but I do want to go ahead and offer the children's moment. So I know there's some young at hearts because I don't want to miss over this important day. So we have palms, and I'm going to grab a little bigger one. This one's a little small. It's important. I do this every year because it's important to understand Palm Sunday is the one day that Jesus was praised while he walked the earth. But those cheers of joy didn't last very long. And so every year, I think it's very important to see. I'm going to make just a few cuts. And you've seen this before, but it's an important reminder every year. We do just a few little things. It's a little harder with this kind of poem. I'm going to have to tear that up. Yeah. Normally, palm strips are what you use, but this is what we have today. Pull it through, go back, go back again, tie it through, and it's very fast. So 
the palm of celebration and joy quickly turned to cries of crucify him. The celebrations didn't last long, and you see how fast we go from a palm to a cross. And so I tied some palm crosses for you. Maybe Elena Morgan, would you help me pass them out? These are the palm strips you usually use. They're of a fan palm, and they kind of open up like a fan. But we have some palm crosses for each of you. If you take just a handful and hand some out. There you go. Elena, whoop. There you go. Make sure everybody gets one. And these are fresh palm. They're wet right now. They're damp. If you put it in your Bible and lay it flat, it'll dry nice and flat, um, and you can keep it forever. In fact, the lady uh, that my mom knew just passed, and she opened her Bible, and there was a palm cross in it. And we do have some extra, so if you want to take some home or take someone to a friend, you're welcome to do that. Yep. Did you get one, Pat? Okay, up there. There's a couple. All right, thank you. If you didn't get one, we've got some right here. Let's have a prayer. God, we remember always that today is a day of joy, but it doesn't last long. And we know what will happen this week. And we know how quickly the cheers of love and praise will turn into shouts of crucify him. Lord, we remember that. And we pray that you would help us to always remember with love in our hearts, the joy and the sacrifice that Christ gave to us. Amen. A word of God for the people of God from Psalms chapter 51, verses 10 through 17. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach trans transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And now please join me in our song of prayer on page 200. What love is this? We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Right. 
righteous crown. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on. I'll sing on, and through eternity, I'll sing on. If you're able, would you please stand and rise and join with me in prayer? Gracious and everlasting Lord, we cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means God saves. We cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We celebrate, celebrate and shout with joy. We wave our palm branches and we remember that day when the people waved palm branches and their clothes and they waved them and strewn the path. And Lord, we remember how excited the people were as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Lord, we remember, too, because we can see from this side of the cross what that day was about and what Jesus was heading towards. And we come to you with open hearts filled with thanksgiving, filled with humble gratitude, filled with joy, knowing the price that Christ paid for our lives, that he was willing to give up his own so that we might live. Today, Lord, we... Pray for our church family, our friends. We pray for those who are struggling at this time. We pray for those who are in need of extra prayers. We pray, Lord, for those prayer concerns that have not been spoken out loud, but that we hold deep in our hearts with worry and care and love. Today we pray for Lori's mother, um, Laurel, and we ask that you would be with her as a source of peace. And Lord, we know that dementia makes it so hard to communicate, but we know that you can speak to her heart in a way that we can't. And we pray that you would just fill her with every joy, fill her with love, and fill her with the Holy Spirit. And we pray too for Lori and her family as they walk with Laurel through this, through this time. And we pray for your strength and your love to surpass all that we understand. We pray today for Casey, God, as she um, undergoes some new testing under the new results on her brain. We pray that the answers are something that can be treated, something that she can be made well from, something that she could be restored. And we pray for healing in her life. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill her as our greatest physician. And we pray that you would hold her through this time, fill her with comfort, and fill her with your strength. We pray for Marge, Lord, who's settled into her new place of living at Trustwell for the time being, and we pray that it would be a good move for her and that she would enjoy her time and that she would um, make new friends and that it would become home to her. God, we pray that you would just watch over and bless her. We pray for this church family and we pray for the ministries that we offer in your holy name. We pray that we might be a beacon of light in this community so that we can serve this the people here, your beloved children. And we pray that you would help us with that mission. God, we pray for the world that we live in. We know that there is so much unrest and fear, so much devastation and loss, not just throughout the world, but right here in our own country, in our own neighborhoods, in our own families. And God, we pray that you would help us to be your hands and feet on earth, that we might be a source of blessing, that we might be a source of healing, that we might be your peace here. Help us to reach out where we can. Help us to be the person and the church and the people that you need us to be. 
Through your holy name, Lord, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give this day our The word of, this is from the Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. A word of God for the people of God. May God add God's blessing. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. May the Lord add a blessing to those holy words. Paul Kendall shares a story about his daughter, Renee, who got lost one evening when she was taking some friends, um, some of her college friends, to the airport one night. Now, it was back in the days when we didn't have map quests and Google Maps on our phone, but Renee did have a cell phone in her car for emergencies. Her plan was to drop her friends off at the airport, and then she was going to retrace her steps coming home, right? Seems simple enough and easy. But as she drove, Renee became more and more anxious as she looked around and nothing seemed familiar. She'd been driving for a very long time. She didn't recognize anything. So finally, panicked, she pulled her cell phone out and she called her dad. And she says, Daddy, I'm lost. And her dad listened, and then she added that she had only a quarter of a gas of tank, and it was getting dark out. So he began panicking, and he asked her, what was the last exit sign you saw? She said, Brookdale. And he said, oh, you're halfway to Georgia. And so he was panicked at that point, too but he was able to go find a driving map, one of the old maps that had all of the roads, and he was able to find where Renee was, and he helped her home the entire drive on the cell phone and helped her by, you're coming up to a railroad stop, you're coming up to this exit, you're coming up to this, until she arrived safely home. He walked her through every single mile. The story that we're looking at this morning with Zacchaeus is all about being lost and being found. We're in the last of our Lenten series entitled Portrait of a Sinner. And my hope is that 
It has helped you recognize your own sinfulness so that we can greet our Lord and Savior on Easter morning with a new appreciation, a deeper appreciation. And so as we enter into this story from Luke 19, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is on his way to what we call Palm Sunday, where we, he will be welcomed with palms and shouts of joy and praises. Before he enters into the great city, he passes through the city of Jericho. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that Jesus stopped or passed through Jericho as sort of his last stop before he entered into Jerusalem. It's in Jericho that he meets Zacchaeus. So who was Zacchaeus? What do we know about him from the scriptures? We know he was a chief tax collector. Throughout the New Testament, we hear about different tax collectors and we've looked at several of them, but nowhere else in scripture does it say chief tax collector. So he is the only one that we're told is a chief of the tax collectors. So somehow he must be in charge of or the boss of all the other tax collectors. And therefore, in our minds, we think he probably was the most detestable and the most crooked, right? Because when we've talked about tax collectors, we looked at the tax collector and the Pharisee, and we talked about how hated tax collectors were. They collected the taxes for Rome, but they were allowed to add on as much extra as they wanted, and anything extra they added on, they could keep for themselves. And so they were hated by the Jewish people. So Zacchaeus is chief among them. He's the top of the tax collectors. We also know that Zacchaeus is a short man, Maybe you learned the song I did growing up. You know the song by Zacchaeus? Yeah, Heather knows it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Right, so we know he's short. We know he's small. We don't, you know, we don't know how tall, but we know he's small. The scriptures also tell us that he was wealthy. We know that he's a rich man. And the other thing the scripture tells us, the kind of last thing we really learn about him, is that he wants to see Jesus. The scripture says he wanted to see who Jesus was, but he couldn't see over the crowds of the people. So we can assume that he has heard of Jesus. He knows something about Jesus, and he's interested in him. He's interested in seeing who Jesus is. Multiple times in these 10 verses that Pat read for us, we have the words to see or some reference to seeing. Just before Zacchaeus in Luke 18, we have a story of a blind man. He was sitting by the side of the road begging when he heard a crowd of people in a commotion. And he asked what was happening and they, were, they told him that Jesus was passing by. And so the blind man cries out, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd told him to be quiet, but he keeps crying out until finally Jesus stops. And Jesus turns the blind, to the blind man and says, what do you want? And the blind man says, I want to see. And then Jesus restored his sight, saying, your faith has healed you. Like the blind man, Zacchaeus also has a physical limitation. The blind man can't see because he's blind. Zacchaeus can't see because he's short. So there's a physical limitation in both stories. And because of this, they can't see. But both of these men want to see. The blind man and Zacchaeus both want to see. So we have really parallel stories in Luke 18 and Luke 19. And then in the Greek at verse 2, um, well, actually, not in the Greek yet. We're just looking at verse 2. I want to show you all the C's. At verse 2, it says, Behold, or look, and then man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Then at verse 3, it says, Zacchaeus wants to see, but he can't see because he's short. In verse 5, Jesus passes by and looks up and sees 
Zacchaeus in the tree. Verse 7, the crowd sees that Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' home and mutters that he's going to the home of a sinner. And then lastly, in verse 8, Zacchaeus says, look, Lord, when he announces that he's giving away half of his possessions to the poor. So do you see how many seeing references there are in just these 10 verses? According to the Greek and Strong's concordance, the Greek verb horeo is used twice in this passage, both times in reference to Zacchaeus wanting to see. The verb means the obvious, that Zacchaeus wanted to physically see Jesus and look out and behold him, see him. But it also carries with it an understanding of spiritually seeing Jesus, wanting to know him, wanting to understand him, wanting to perceive him, wanting to know him in a, in a more full, powerful way, not just to look upon, but to know who Jesus is. And so we have Zacchaeus, who knows something of Jesus because he's heard of him, and now what we see is that he really wants to know who Jesus is. He's seeking with his whole heart to know who Jesus is. He wants to know his mission, his person, his purpose, who this is. And when Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' home, he gets the opportunity. And in response, his heart is completely changed. To see is to seek. Interestingly, if, you talk, if we look at the, the blind man from chapter 18, Jesus references his faith, healing him. But in the story of Zacchaeus, there's no reference to his faith. There's no reference to his repentance. There's no cry out for mercy. Yet Jesus says salvation has arrived at the home of Zacchaeus. And he restates his mission the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was lost, and now he's found. Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus, and Jesus is seeking him back. Now, also in Luke 18, right before we meet Zacchaeus, there's another story, and it's the story of the rich young ruler. And the story of the rich young ruler goes that he comes to Jesus and he wants to know what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus tells him he needs to follow all the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, oh yeah, I'm doing that. That's good. And then Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. But the rich young ruler can't do it. And so he turns away sad and he leaves. So now in Luke 19, we have another contrasting story because we meet another rich man named Zacchaeus. But this man, Zacchaeus, never asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. He doesn't ask Jesus anything, actually. But in his experience with Jesus, his heart is so changed that he voluntarily offers to give half of his possessions to the poor. And he says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. When we truly meet Christ, we are changed people. Jesus does not want blind obedience, following legalistic laws like the rich ruler. He wants our hearts given over to him in love. Now, Jesus never says you have to be poor to follow him. But he does say you can only serve one master. We must be willing to put Jesus first in our lives. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus does. In contrast to the rich young ruler, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. The fourfold restitution that Zacchaeus offers is not a requirement. Jesus never asks him to give that much. His offering to restore relationships and pay an abundance of restitution is because Zacchaeus himself in his heart is overwhelmed and overcome with thanksgivings. God never wants us to give out of compulsion or guilt, but freely with an open heart. 
Zacchaeus has many changes that he probably needs to make in his life and in the next days and months and weeks ahead. But the first change, the one that matters the most, is the change of heart. Because when our hearts change, we can trust that the other things will change too. They are the outward sign of inward change. We talk about that a lot with baptism, an outward sign of what's going on inside our hearts. So what can we learn from this story of Zacchaeus? The first thing is, is that Jesus wants to have a real relationship with us. Jesus already knows who Zacchaeus is. He knows he's in the tree. He calls him by name. He goes to Zacchaeus' house to dine with him. Jesus knows exactly who we are too, and he knows where we are too. We must invite him into our lives. Just like Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus and wanted to see him and to know him, Jesus wants us to want him too. The other day in our online Bible study, we were talking about the famous painting, Christ at Heart's Door by Warner Salmon. And you've probably seen it before, but it's a picture of Jesus standing at the door and he's knocking to be let in. And the interesting thing, though, is if you look really carefully, there's no door handle on the outside. Jesus cannot open that door to come in. It has to be opened on the inside. And that's exactly what it is. Jesus will never force his way into our lives. He wants us to open the door for him and welcome him in. Jesus is there knocking, waiting, calling, but we must take the first step of seeking him and inviting him in. The second thing we can take from this story is that you're never too lost to be found. No matter what secret sins you carry within your heart, no matter what you find in the dark recesses of your spirit, no matter what your past is, you are never too lost to be found by Jesus. The story of Zacchaeus is all about being lost and being found. Zacchaeus was lost to everyone. He was lost to the Jewish culture, to the Jewish religion, probably lost to his family and his friends because of his occupation, except maybe other tax collectors. He was even lost to himself in many ways. Jesus didn't need to find him. He already knew where he was, and Jesus met him there. For Zacchaeus, it was up a tree as Jesus passed by. But wherever you find yourself, wherever you are, Know that Jesus will meet you there if you want to be found. Zacchaeus illustrates Jesus' words, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. <clears throat> the third thing we can learn from this is that we must come down from where we are if we want to meet Jesus. So Zacchaeus literally climbed a tree so he would be high enough to see Jesus. When Jesus stops and calls out to him, Zacchaeus had to physically descend from the tree to come down to meet Jesus. What happened physically also happened spiritually in this story. Zacchaeus spiritually humbles himself before Jesus. In verse 6, it says, He came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Before everyone, before the religious authority, before the crowds of people, Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus gladly into his home and into his life. He physically and spiritually humbled himself. We too must come down from where we are so that we can meet Jesus. The arrogant of heart will never meet Jesus until they come down from their lofty heights of ego and pride. We must humble ourselves. And the last thing we learn from this story is don't let the mumblers watching interfere with what you want. There are always people who will grumble and mumble about what you're doing. Whether it's what you wear, whether it's what you do, whether it's how you speak, whether it's how you live, someone will always be there to criticize you. The crowd probably grumbled when Zacchaeus started climbing the tree. We know they grumbled and mumbled when Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home. 
And it would have been really easy for Zacchaeus to listen to those crowds and to turn Jesus away, to give in to the complaints and the criticism. But he wanted to know Jesus. He didn't allow the people and their grumbling to throw him off course to what he really wanted. And in his persistence and in his determination, he received a life-changing reward. We too must stay the course to what we are seeking, never allowing those who are mumbling to throw us off course. In the story I shared at the beginning about Renee, lost on the road, when she got home, her father had the biggest hug for her. He was so happy to have his daughter home and safe. Luke tells us in his gospel several stories about a lost coin, a lost sheep, a lost son, and the father's response when his lost son is returned home is, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Wherever you find yourself in the midst of this Lenten season as we enter into Holy Week, know that Jesus is always seeking you and he rejoices in your life. He will always find you. Amen. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. While we may not have crops, we understand the spirit of these words to honor God with the best of what we have. Let us honor God with our wealth, our time, and our talents, for we have been richly blessed. We give in response to all that we have been given. 
May our gifts reflect our gratitude and our love. We collect our offering in the offering trays on the communion table, where you may place your tithes or offering there upon ex exiting. To those watching at home, if you feel inclined, you may mail in your offering, drop it by the church, or use the Easy Tithe app to electronically give. May we give generously and joyfully. Let us pray. The crowds offered you their coats to walk on. They wave palm branches, honoring your presence. Today we honor you, Lord, with our faithful tithes and offering. We lay these gifts before you, humble tokens of our love, a public display of affection for our King of Kings. Amen. came in. I hope that you picked up a communion. If you did not, we have some in the back and we have some up front so we can share together in just a few moments. We'll share communion. You know, we've, we've talked about today being Palm Sunday and the waving of the branches, the strewing of the clothes, and the day that Jesus was praised and worshipped. And we've talked about how this was the only day on this earth that he was ever praised but it was for the wrong reason. The people didn't understand who he was. They thought he was coming into Jerusalem to overthrow the Roman government, to be their next king, and to fix what was wrong with Rome. They trusted in him to be their next ruler. They didn't understand that he was the Prince of Peace, the Lord of salvation. They didn't understand who he was. And even though the people were joyful and happy and celebrated, Scripture tells us that right before Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he wept over the great city. He wept because the people didn't understand. And they didn't understand who he was and they didn't understand what he came to do. We look back on that day 2,000 years later, and we do understand. We do understand what Jesus was walking toward. We understand the irony of their cheers, and we understand how they will change into shouts of death. We hold all of this in our hearts. As we come to the table today, we come remembering the whole story. We come knowing that Jesus wept as he entered into Jerusalem, knowing what he would face. And even still, he went forward. He knew the cross was waiting, and he was willing to give his life for us, for you, for me, for each and every one of us. He had his eyes set on the cross, and he had his eyes set on us. So let us come to the table today, and let us hold it all in our hearts and in our prayers and in our thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> now please join me in our song of communion on page 195. When I survey the wondrous cross, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
When Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he will gather with his disciples in an upper room. And in the upper room, they dined together. And it was there that he took a loaf of bread and he showed it to the disciples and he blessed it before them. And then he broke it. And he told the disciples, take and eat this. This is my body, it is broken for you. After they had supped together, he took a cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as we eat the bread, as often as we drink the cup, we do so in remembrance of him. The disciples didn't understand what he was saying, but we do and we give thanks for his life offered for us. Let us pray. Spirit of God, bless our bread and cup. Bless all of us as we reflect together on this holiest of weeks. Bless our minds and hearts during our time at the table today as we seek the grace given to us by you. Amen. Share together the bread of life and the cup of salvation. If there is anyone that would like to unite with this congregation by transfer of membership or by confession of faith, you're invited to come forward as we stand and sing. Now, please ride, join me in our song of commitment on page 191. Ride on, ride on in majesty, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Ride on, ride on in majesty of all the crowds, Hosanna cry through waving branches, slowly ride, O Savior, to be crucified. Ride on, ride on in majesty in lowly pomp. Oh, Christ, your triumph. 
comes now began or captive death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty, your last and fearest fall defy. Bow your meek head to mortal pain, then take all God your power and reign. May the good Lord watch over, bless, and keep each and every one of us. Until we meet again, may the good Lord hold us in his almighty hands. Until we meet again, amen.